Man, I'm excited to be here. I know at this point I'm supposed to compliment Pastor Chad and Pastor Amber, and that's easy for me. Um, no, that's what you're supposed to do as a guest speaker. Immediately be like, I'm going to show honor where honor is due. The reality is, the reality is they invited me here, but it's not so much they invited me here as what they do outside of the invitation here. We have a lot in common because your pastor is my pastor. I want you to understand pastors need pastors. Pastor needs people that can call, they can call when everything else is in a wreck and they don't have anybody to call. I can tell you Pastor Chad is not only in a leadership position over me in our section, I get to lead underneath him and I get to see him and how well he leads other people and other pastors. Pastor Chad's my pastor because when I want to celebrate, he's the first person I want at the party. And when I want to cry, and there's been moments where I've had to cry, he's the one that answers the phone. And then he cries with me. And if he pastors you half as good as he pastors me, you are a very lucky people. And one time, can you just let him and Pastor Amber know how thankful you are? Ridiculous how good your pastors are. If you want to know about me and my family and all that fun stuff, Talk to me afterwards. I got a mission I got to accomplish today. I've got a word I'm going to say, and then I'm going to get out the way and let God do what he wants to do. I'm not going to speak long tonight. I really don't think so. I've been wrong before. But I, I don't think I'm speaking very long tonight. But I do have this question, like this real question inside of me of like, I don't mean to be rude or anything, but like, why are you here on a Monday night? This ain't Sunday Nobody's taking attendance, are you? No, okay, yeah. <laughs> it's not part of a requirement for membership. There's nothing that says you have to be here. And yet on your first day back at work, you decided I'm gonna hustle through the grind and I'm gonna get my kids and I'm gonna get myself and I'm gonna come to church with expectation that I'm gonna meet with God. And guess what, you're right. You're right, because God was more excited about you getting here than you were about you getting here. And um, the second question I have that maybe you have, maybe we're going to answer this question together tonight, is this idea of, Pastor Chad, you tell us why we're here. Why are we doing this on a Monday night and a Tuesday night and a Sunday night? Why are we doing revival nights? It's a great question. And I'm sure you've tried to answer that question for yourself. Why are we doing this thing we've never done before? Maybe you're thinking, oh, Pastor Chad just wants us to look spiritual. No, that's not it. Oh, these revival nights, they're just, um, you know, extensions of worship nights. No, they're not. Oh, he just needed a platform to bring his friends in and preach. I don't think so. But no. Oh, hold on to your wallet. He's going to take another offering, right? I mean, maybe, I have no idea. I, it's not up to me. I didn't plan the service. All I'm telling you is if God told you to give, you should give, not reluctantly, so that he can give back to you, not reluctantly. But if you think we're trying to do a building campaign, that's not why we're here. It's revival nights and named revival nights for a, for a specific reason. And I'll answer that by asking a question. And everybody, don't be surface level. It's Monday night. You don't have your Sunday best on. You don't have to put on your fake mask like everything was okay because you had Saturday all day to prep for your smile on Sunday. It's Monday. Let's get real for a second. You ask me why revival nights? And I ask you, seriously, how are you doing? Sincerely, not surface level, let's get real. How's your marriage? How's your relationship with your kids? How's your relationship with your parents? Ooh, how's your relationship with yourself? How are your finances? Oh, how's that dream working out that you thought would be accomplished by now, but it's not? What about that job that you thought was going to change everything last year that you know you're about to lose? How is it that that it seems like for some of us, we had all these expectations of how the new year was going to change and be a new us. And yet somehow 2023 is starting worse than 2022 started. 
You asked me why revival nights, I just gave you the reason for revival nights because maybe you are misunderstood about what revival is and I'm sure you have misconceptions that it's supposed to be some three hour service and hyped energy and everybody's supposed to snot and cry at the end. That's not why revival nights. Revival nights is because of the revival part of it. Because revival is simply this, boil it down, remove all the pretty. Revival is nothing more than things that are dead being brought back to life. And I asked you these questions so that you can quickly identify what is dead around you. Once again, how are you doing? How's your emotions doing? How are you dealing with that loss you didn't know was going to happen last year? How are you dealing with that hurt that you didn't think that person would ever do to you? There's some things that are dead around you that the next thing God wants to do is to bring you back to life. And you might say, well, Pastor Brendan, my marriage, we're not dead yet. We're not dead. We fight a lot and we, we can't argue, we argue about everything and we're sleeping in se separate rooms, but, but, but we're not dead. Great, you're on life support. You're hearing this faint, subtle beep, beep. And you don't know if the next beep is going to happen. We might not totally be decomposing, but I promise you we're not alive the way God wants us alive. And so then if we, if we understand why we're here, that, that Pastor Chad and God are wanting to bring back to life what you thought was dead, maybe never returnable, maybe you thought it was forgotten in God, maybe you thought God lied to you. But God says, I can even revive your faith. I can revive my grace. I can revive your past and even your future mistakes. I can bring life back to what you think is dead and forgotten. And we see that in scripture. Turn with me to Isaiah. Isaiah chapter 57. As we're going there, I, I want you to uh, understand kind of the premise of the scripture we're reading. This is the prophet Isaiah God is speaking to him, to his people, Israel. Before this chapter, you need to understand the premise and kind of where God is. Um, in case you don't know this relationship, it is a, a, a parent and child relationship, truly to the degree at which you and I struggle as parents. God is struggling with his children, the people of Israel. One day they are for him and we're all about you, God. And the next day they're like, God, who? And they're like, God is sitting there going, no, no, I chose you. I picked you. I made promises to you I have never made to anyone else, and I fulfill my promises. I'm always good on it. And yet when everything seems to be getting good, you turn your back on me. And God is furious. Because it's not just him they're turning their back on. They are not only doing harm to themselves, but they're doing harm to their own people because they're bringing in idol worship, things that distract them from the true God. They're bringing in uh, ritualistic uh, behavior from other pagan gods. And God is saying, no, 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 I'm God. This is supposed to be about me. Why are you letting other things in your life distract you from me? And he's furious. He literally says, I could ruin you. Do you understand? He's showing his magnitude and his might. He's showing his power by saying, I could have squashed you like bugs, started all over again, but I made you a promise. I love him, different parts of scripture. He always refers to that. I would kill you, but I promised I wouldn't. Sounds like my mom saying, I brought you into this world. Try me one more time, sucker. But she was bluffing just like I was bluffing because God was true to his word. I promised you happiness. I promised you uh, the promised land that, that you would be secure and happy. And guess what God has made promise to us even today, 2,000 years later. We are now his children. We are called his children. And he says the same promises I've made to generations before you, I still will hold with you. If, in my terms, you start acting right. Sometimes you just need somebody that's not your pastor to come in and like cause a little mischief, a little chaos, disrupt your little comfortable lifestyle to say, hey, there's a point in time where you just have to decide I'm mature enough spiritually that I'm going to act like a Christian, not just pretend. Amen. And that's what God's saying. He's saying, dude, I almost dropped the hammer on you. 
Like, I was so furious with you because just like a parent, it's not that they're disobeying. They're disobeying, and it is causing immediate harm to them. And God's saying, I'm not trying to give you rules to create a prison. I'm creating boundaries for your paradise. That if you live inside these boundaries of safety and protection, if you put me at the center of your life, I can help you fix all the other things. And they'll be in a season of just plentiful harvest and manna from heaven, and then they forget the miracles that he's done. And they turn their back on him, and this is that moment. And yet God, in his grace, starts chapter 57 by saying, I want to give you a way to come back. He says, you've, you've failed me, you've sinned against me, I literally thought about destroying you. Period. Next chapter. Now here's how you get back. Are you grateful tonight that God always makes a way back? That no matter how far, this is the analogy I love, no matter how far I run from God, I always turn around and realize he's keeping me in step. Like he's faster than me, he's quicker than me, I'm exhausted from running from him and he's excited to pick me up and carry me back to where we're supposed to be. God doesn't give up on us. His promises are true and so this is what he says to his people. He says in Isaiah 57, Verse 15, he says, for this is what the high and exalted one says. You see it there on the screen. If you got it in your Bible, I promise to highlight this. You'll want to go back to it. I live in the high and holy place. Stop. And I'm going to be going through Scripture slowly. That's just how I do. It's, I think it's all perfect and awesome. I want to just dig it out. But let's just take a second and stop. Listen and understand what God is starting his statement with to his people. He's saying, I am lifted high and holy. I am above all. This is what the Lord God says. What is he doing? He's creating separation between his majesty and our failure. He wants to put priority and person back in order. You guys have leveled the playing field and think that you are like me, but you're not God. I am. And sometimes, and you'll see it in just a moment, the reason he's doing this, yes, is to humble them. Because if you will not be humbled before God, you will be humbled by God. Please understand, he doesn't want to whip you down, but if you won't stand up the way he told you to, he will. And he says, I am God. You are not. There is a separation between my righteousness and your sin. However, he makes a caveat to us. He says, though I exist in the high and the holy places, I live in the high and the holy places, he makes a caveat that there are some who will be with me. And in the very next scripture, he, he, he tells them that, that, that though you are in the high and lowly places, there are also people with me, one who is contrite and lowly in spirit. Contrite is just a, another word for repentant. Repentant meaning, God, I failed up. I failed. I messed up. Please forgive me. That's it. That's what repentance is. And he says, if you're repentant and lowly in spirit, you can come with me. He's not talking about angels here. He's not talking about other people up. He's not talking about heaven. He's talking about his presence. He says, I live in a high and holy place, but those people who are lowly in spirit and repentant in heart can exist in my presence. Do you get that? God says, I'm way up here and you're way down here. But if you realize that I'm way up here and you're way down here, I'll bring you to me. And you can exist with me. But if pride gets in the way, you can't come to my presence. I love that because God is saying, I want you around me, but I want you to have the right heart to be around me. I don't want you around me because what might fall out of my hands is a form of blessing or favor. I know favor ain't fair, but God doesn't want you to just love him because of what he gives you. And so he tells his children, he says, hey, I want you to come where I am, but you've got to repent. You have to be humble. And he repeats that even through scripture as we continue to read. He says, I restore or revive the crushed spirit of the humble. Once again, I don't want anyone to answer. I don't want you to moan. I don't want you to blink. I don't want you to do anything. But let me ask this question. Is there, is there anybody in this place that you could say, Pastor, my spirit's been a little crushed. There's some things that I thought God would have accomplished by now in my life, and I feel a little crushed. I 
feel like my, my marriage would be fixed by now. I figured by now my kid would have called me and said, Mom, I'm so sorry for the homosexual lifestyle I'm living. I want to come back to Jesus, but I'm not getting that phone call, God. God, I feel like you failed me. I feel like you lost me because sometimes the timetable that we put on God is not the timetable he wants to work in. And we think he's late or he forgot because we hurt. But he says, if you're dead in some area, all you have to do is just be humble. If you're broken in spirit, just come to me and I can revive you. That's where the revival comes from. The idea of reviving is those that are crushed, those that are broken, those that can't handle it on their own. He says, the humble I'll restore. And then he says, I'll revive the courage of those with repentant hearts. We talked about that, repent. Repent and remorse are different. Remorse says, I feel bad I got caught. Remorse says, I don't want to face the consequences of my own bad mistakes. Repentance says, God, I'm going in the wrong way. I don't feel bad that I did that. I feel bad that I've separated myself from you. So God, if I'm heading in a direction, may I stop. And what repent literally means is turning a complete different direction. God, I'm heading towards damnation. And God found me. And because I was humble enough to repent in this season, I turned around and I started following the path that he has laid before me. But sometimes my pride comes over me and I'll turn around and think I can, can do it on my own. And I'll get lost in my own way and I'll have to stop. But God says, if you're crushed in spirit because you've been going the wrong direction, you need to repent. But he says that he'll, he'll give courage. That's interesting to me because why does someone that needs to repent lack courage? I think it's actually a lot more simple than we make it. We're repenting because we have sin inside of us. We repent because there's sin that we haven't confessed to God. And so why does God say, I'll give you back courage. Those of you who have been living in sin, I want to bring you back courage. Why? Because sin steals your confidence. Because the first person you fail when you sin is yourself. Because you couldn't say no one more time. Because though you thought you had that addiction broken, you fell right back into it again. You ended 2022 saying, man, 2023 is my year. No more of this. And by January 3, you were like, here we go again. God says, you've lost your courage. You won't stand up for me because you won't be humble enough to come and let me clean that sin out of you. Because it's hard to stand for Jesus if you're worried someone's going to call you out for your sin. It's hard to make a declaration and, and, and talk about Jesus to people who you know see a different form of you outside the church. What if this is the year, for real? What if 2023 was the year where we just decide we are going to actually try our best to stop sinning? What if 2023 was the year you stopped lying? And I'm not talking about that's your sin. I'm talking about what if you stopped lying to yourself, to God, and all the people who are trying to help you, that you have it under control, and it's not hurting anyone, and nobody knows about it, so why does it even matter? What if you just stop lying about your sin? And you trusted somebody in one of your life groups to actually walk you through a level of accountability you've never asked for. So that God can bring courage back into your life to stand as a man of God, to stand as a mom of God, to stand as a young person that says, I'm not, I'm not perfect, but when I fail, I run back to Jesus. And he brings me courage to keep walking this life out. Some of you can't walk like a Christian because you have no courage because you won't accept the fact that you're living in sin. Why can, you can't stand up for Jesus when you know that you're laying down with somebody you shouldn't be. Let me talk to my guys for just a second because I'm just telling you this is an issue. I'm not telling you some of us. I'm telling you it's an issue. I talk to more guys every single day that this is the issue. What if we stop lying to ourselves in our men's Bible studies, in our men's breakfasts, that, hey, man, I'm just doing so great. Read all the way through Matthew this week when you've literally been watching porn every single day. What 
What if as ladies we actually confess the fact that we resent our husband for something that he doesn't even know he did? And we stop holding back forgiveness because it's a tool that we get to use to manipulate our spouse. What if we finally confess to ourselves, God, I can't do this on my, my, my own. And in revival nights, I want to be alive again. So God, would you come and heal me of my, my lack of being able to repent? God, would you heal me of my sin, my known sin, my unknown sin? God, let me be humble enough to say, God, I can't do this. Because God wants to revive you. He wants to bring life back to what you think is dead. What does revival look like? Man, I'm fascinated with the idea of revival. I remember when I was eight years old. Eight years old, 1995. In case you're trying to do the math, I'm 35. I'll be 36 this year. I, um, I think that's right. Is that right? Oh, geez. I'm at that point. I'm at that point. It doesn't matter anymore. So you're like, I don't know. I'm not 60. I don't. I don't. No, I'm saying. No, 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 no. I'm not Pastor Chad. I like old people. What I'm saying is. No, wait, wait my bad. No, 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 my fault, my fault, my fault. I didn't. No, I didn't. Wait. No, see. What, but if you. No, I'm saying that because I want the discounts. I want the discount card. I'll eat, I'll eat dinner at 1130 in the morning. Like, I'll do that. <laughs> dun, 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 Guess who's never getting invited back again. Never getting invited back again. Oh, my jeez. In 1995, there was a... Uh... We could, like, edit that out of the video. You're not posting this, right? Good. My mom is going to be humiliated. Okay. Can the, can the keyboard come play so that I like sound, I like, I sound spiritual at least, like something. Hey, remember that one time when I ruined a good message? you guys remember? You were there. You saw it. And we're back. All right. 1995. This, uh. This revival took place in Brownsville. Anybody hear of the Brownsville revival? Yeah, you're around. It was really cool. I was fascinated by it because I heard stories of what was going down and, and the exciting things that were happening. I literally heard stories of, 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 of this incredible move of God that was happening at this church. The, the newspaper in the city just started writing about cars that, that, that were having to drive on the, and park in the interstate just because the parking lot was overflowing. They said that, that once the news got out, in the first 365 days, in the first one year of the inception of revival at Brownsville, over 1.7 million people sat through a service. Over 100,000 people in one year, in the first year, over 100,000 people gave their life to Jesus. And I'm eight years old going, those numbers don't even compute in my brain. I'm like, this is incredible. And, and so what we did, I remember uh, my dad was a pastor and we had this awesome young adults uh, group. And so we got like a 15 passenger van and put like 45 young adults in it and then like send it down to Brownsville. You know how you do as a church, like legal, eh, you know what I'm saying? <laughs> We're doing it for Jesus. Like he'll protect us, you know, like. And dude, they were excited. I remember we prayed over them as they left and they were like driving out, singing worship songs. And I was so excited for them to come back because I wanted to hear what it was like. And man, they came back with stories. They said there was not a lot of places to eat there and because there were so many people in the city, it took an hour and a half to get a table at Waffle House. They said it was standing room only outside the door six hours before service started because so many people just wanted to be in the building. I have personal friends that, that went and were healed. Like I'm talking about actual, I knew that that was, their arm was like jacked up and they came back and like, it's not jacked up. And I'm like, I was eight, okay? I don't know what the medical term was, but it was not jacked up anymore. They told me that uh, multiple people were wheeled up on stage with, with the inability to walk and they would be prayed over, stand up, throw their wheelchair. I'm like, you gotta be kidding me. I'll be honest, the spiritual side of it, I, I'm eight years old. I wanted to see somebody's arm grow back. That's really what I wanted to see. I knew a guy that only had from the elbow down, I'm like, do him. Like, I want to see that. 
I'll testify. Like, I just want to see it. I was excited when they returned back. I was like, man, they're going to bring back revival. That's what I thought. And you know what they did bring back? Man, they brought back energy and passion. They were so excited. I remember that first, like, two months, the entire front would be filled, much like tonight. Man, people were excited about the thought of revival. I remember how they brought it back. They brought back the, the newest worship songs that they heard while they were there. And the one that was just really crushing it was um, at the end of every song, uh, at the end of every service, the pastor would start an invitation. Hey, if you don't know Jesus, in just a moment, I want you to come down. But then they would sing this song. This little girl in this little black dress would sing this song called Mercy Seat. And she was just going, I'm running to the mercy. She sang it better. But that's what she would do. And when she said, I'm running to the mercy seat, the pastor would, would stand up and go, if you want Jesus, you run to in thousands. Thousands of people would stand up all across the auditorium and sprint to a stage like they were giving away an award. People would be slain in the spirit, not because someone pushed them, because the spirit of God was so thick in that place, they couldn't stand any longer. And they brought back these stories, and they brought back these songs, and man, we were having church for like two months. We thought we sparked revival. We just learned new songs. Because they wanted to travel and experience revival. They didn't want to pay the price to live in it. And we didn't understand that. We thought if you sang the right songs and you gave the right message and you yelled loud enough and spit uh, enough that, that everyone would be excited and revival would start. But revival isn't that. Revival is one person that was dead, one marriage that was dead, one dream that was dead, one hope that was dead, being brought back to life. That's it. And the revival that God wants to do here isn't going to look like a revival He's done anywhere else because God doesn't like to repeat Himself. He likes to do a new thing. He's got something next for this church. He's got something next for you. But I can promise you the next thing he wants to do is to bring you back to life. So that you can enjoy and experience and be fulfilled in the next thing he wants to do. Because that's not revival. I, I thought they were bringing it back. I thought that they were coming back. But true revival is best illustrated through the, the word of God. Through a guy named Ezekiel. The guy named Ezekiel, God, God gives him this picture of, I believe, what revival really looks like. He walks him out to this valley of dry bones. And he says, look across. And he looks across, and this valley is completely piled of death. There was a battle that ensued there, and many lost their lives. Many were mangled. There's limbs that are left out there. There's bones that are decaying. Crows are eating at the flesh that is left. And he's laying, look across this dry bones. Ezekiel looks, and maybe today you're looking. And man, you see your hope standing out there. Dead. You see your child that doesn't serve Jesus laying lifeless on the battlefield. Actually, would you just, just for a moment, would you close your eyes all across this place? And would you just ask God this question, God, what's dead in me? And then with your eyes shut, would you just begin to imagine that, that battlefield that Ezekiel was standing in front of, that battlefield where things had died, and I want you to put your death right in the middle. And I want you to keep your eyes shut until you can see it like it's right in front of you. And now I want you to see ready, when you see it, when you have that picture so clear in your mind in just a moment, I want you to open your eyes and I want you to see what God said he can do with just a valley of dry bones. The hand of the Lord was upon me. He brought me out by the Spirit of the Lord and set me in the middle of a valley. It was
was full of bones. He led me back and forth among them, and I saw a great many bones on the floor of the valley. He asked me, Son of man, can these bones live? I said, O sovereign Lord, you alone know. Then he said to me, Prophesy to these bones and say to them, Dry bones, hear the voice of the Lord. I will make breath into you and you will come to life. Then you will know that I am the Lord. So I prophesied as I was commanded, and as I was prophesying, there was a noise, a rattling sound, and the bones came together, bone to bone. I looked, and tendons and flesh appeared on them, and skin covered them, but there was no breath in them. Then he said to me, Prophesy to the breath, and say to it, Come from the four winds, O breath, and breathe into these slain that they may live. So I prophesied as he commanded me, and breath entered them. They came to life and stood up on their feet, a vast army. That, that's what revival looks like. It looks like what was forgotten and lost. Forgot, it looks like the things that we left out because we never thought we'd see them again. It looks like a valley of dead dreams, hopeless relationships, financial destruction, self-esteem at the bottom of where you never thought you'd be about yourself. That's where the valley is, but, but that's not what revival is. Revival is that valley being made alive again. See, what you don't understand about the Browns of Revival, no one understood until many years later. They interviewed the pastor. They interviewed these different people. Pastor inevitably said, the revival didn't start in 95. He said, two years earlier, in 1993, and the, 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 the members of the, the church that were able to be questioned remember this like it was yesterday. They said the pastor stood up on a random Sunday morning. He said, I've been praying for revival. I believe that God wants to do something in our church that he's never done before. I believe that there's going to be people that are saved, people that are healed. But it's dependent upon you and I praying and seeking the face of God until revival shows up. And so you know what he did? He said, I want you to meet me tomorrow night right here at the church, a night just like this. And he said, as many of you have faith enough to believe in revival, show up with me and come with me. And they turned on worship music and they began to sing. And the pastor got on the stage and he said, we're going to pray until God brings revival. And they showed up week after week, night after night. And they said that, that, that when they looked back through the hallways of the small meeting room where they were praying, there would be streaks of water down the sides of the, the walls where people were banging their head, crying out in tears. But let me tell you, they weren't asking for revival for a church. They were asking for revival for themselves. They were asking for revival for me because your family doesn't need revival, you do. They need you to be the spark that sets revival in your family. Listen, I, I, I don't know how it's gonna happen here. I just know this, revival's gonna start with me. And I'm not taking ownership of the revival, I'm taking ownership of my revival. That I don't care if you take this message, let it go through you and you forget about it. I'm going after my revival because I'm tired of feeling dead. I'm tired of feeling less than. I'm tired of feeling like God wants to do more in me. And so I'm asking God, if there's sin in my life, God, I repent of it. I'm humble enough to know that you are God and I am not. And God, I want to be made alive. And when you say that with everything inside of you, you will feel the ground begin to shake. And you will feel the wind of change begin to come. And what you thought was dead, God will breathe life into if, if you will seek His face. If you will turn from your wicked ways, if you will repent and be humble, it's not about the prayer, it was about people seeking revival. And I hear the stories that it wasn't many, maybe a dozen or two, definitely less than what we have in this room. And so I wish that, that I had some people in this room that would say, Pastor Brennan, I'll seek for revival. 
I'll go after God with everything inside of me because I do believe God's got something next for me that I've never seen before. And I want to make sure that everything inside of me is alive and ready for when God is ready to move, I'm going to move with Him. Because it's not about this church. It's about the people who haven't found this church yet. It's about the people that are sitting a block away that has no idea who Jesus is. But because you are in line with the Father, you're going to speak life where they've only heard death. And you're going to be the revival that starts in this community. But it doesn't need to start in a community until it starts in a church. It doesn't need to start in a church until it starts in someone. You've got to own your own revival. You can't wait on Pastor Chad to speak good enough that you get your revival. You can't wait for the worship team to sing the right song before you get your revival. I don't even care if they don't put the lyrics on the screen and you can't sing along. God didn't say sing their song. He said sing your song. And I know I sing passion. I just know what it feels like to be alive. And more importantly, I remember what it felt like to be dead. And if you're sitting out there dead today, I'm telling you there's hope in Jesus. There's hope and grace that is sufficient for all your mistakes and all your sins. Everything you thought pushed you away from him was only pulling you closer to him because he is not far from the brokenhearted. And he's standing right there in the valley. But I love that he told Ezekiel to speak it out. He could have just spoken himself and the wind would have come. But he wanted to see if Ezekiel had the faith enough to speak with God it's not going to be about somebody laying hands on you and praying it's about you having the courage to say God whatever you want to do I'm ready for you to do it in me would you stand up with me all across this room because here's how we're going to conclude tonight is this worship band is going to sing us into revival and you're going to find a place in this room where you can create an altar between you and God and here's two things you're going to do you're going to find a way to be humble you maybe for the first time ever aren't going to God saying, God, would you fix my marriage? Would you fix this? You're saying, God, would you fix me? Would you clean me out? Some of you, you know right now what that sin is that you need to repent from. You need to ask the grace and mercy of God to clean you out so that you can walk straight again. God, I pray that the God of revival sweeps across this place. I pray that the wind of life comes blowing in. God, would you shake the very ground of what you stand on so that we know that we have been touched by the God of revival. In Jesus' name, in Jesus' name, we call on the God of revival to bring back to life what we thought was dead. In Jesus' name, come on, let's worship.